And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is the author Michael Horn, who is recognized as the world's leading authority on UFOs. He has over 40 years of experience as a science researcher and began his study and research into what are known as the Billy Meyer UFO contacts in 1979. Michael likes to say that he's the only UFO researcher to be interrogated for three months by the U.S. military intelligence. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Michael, if you don't mind, can we just start with how did you get into researching UFOs in the first place? Sure. Um, as, a, as a very young uh, boy, I, I was fascinated with what were, you know, rocket ships at the time. I was listening to early radio shows with the space heroes of the 1940s and 50s. And then uh, as it evolved into television, watching the earliest space shows. But I also used to dream as a very young child of fleets of round disks up in the night sky. And uh, this started very, very, you know, early in my in my life. And I wanted to know the answer to certain cosmic and uh, existential questions about, you know, what is... Uh, what is God? What's outside of space? Who was Jesus? The, and I it came from a totally non-religious background, and I don't, I don't even know how it was coming into my mind. Those things, but certainly the things about you know how could there be nothing, and how far does it go, and these kind of things. That was starting when I was about nine or ten years old, and then uh, during my you know teen years, my interest in so-called flying saucers was still there. There wasn't a lot of information available. It was probably about 1956 or 7 that a, uh, a fellow, a classmate in the school I was going to, came up to me to tell me that his dad told him, his dad, he told me, was in the military, I think the Air Force, that a flying saucer had crashed and had been moved to an Air Force base in Ohio. Never forgot that. I know exactly where I was standing at the time. And then it would be, uh, you know, as I got older and finally in 1979, I walk into a bookstore in Los, in Los Angeles called the Bodhi Tree. And there was a photo book, um, the clear, clearest UFO photos in that book I'd ever seen. It's a book. It was it was a precursor to the book that's that's on my left here, and it was I think called UFO Contact from the Pleiades, and it was about this man Billy Meyer. And I mean, I saw that book, and it was like everything came to a, to a to a sudden you know stop right there. I've got to have that book, and that I got the book, and I read because there was a lot of information written in amazing amazing photographs they still are the clearest evidence of actual ufos extraterrestrial i should be very precise about that ufos and uh there was information about the man who was the photographer who turns out to be the contact person with an extraterrestrial race according to the information and other information in there about the testing of the photos and that there were sound recordings that were tested and metal samples and and quotes from the uh, extraterrestrials and it would be uh, probably about another oh eight six seven eight years until i would be in a cafe in sedona arizona and uh, with a friend of mine and my daughter and one other person sitting at the far end, beckoning him over, we're talking. Billy Meyer case comes up. He, it turns out, uh, lived also in L.A. where I was living at the time. And he had, he told me the 1,800 pages of transcripts that were the translation of Billy Meyer's early uh, conversations with these people. And if I could, would come back and visit him in L.A., uh, he'd give it to me, which... I did and he did. So it all evolved from that. And it evolved to my starting to do presentations on this material uh, in about 1987. I had worked with a guy named Randy Winters, who was an excellent presenter, just a very, very good, good speaker. Uh, and I was actually his opening act. I used to do new age comedy and music and then sit in the audience and watch his presentations. Uh, there were things about it that made me want to do my own presentations. And Randy 
generously gave me a carousel of codex slides and said, yeah, go, go ahead and do it. And it ended up then that uh, I went to Switzerland for the first time in about 2000, I think it was, yeah, to meet Meyer, Billy Meyer, and other people from around the world who were involved in studying this material. And uh, then I asked him in about 2004 if I could officially represent this material and him in the English-speaking world in America, for sure. And it would evolve that I would do this in other you know, English-speaking countries. And we created an agreement whereby I could do this voluntarily so that it was done without the any substantiation to which the kind of attacks I knew and he knew were, would come, which was, oh, you're just in it for the money, blah, 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 you know. And I, I said, you know, we'll just do this. It's a voluntary thing. I'm nuts about doing this. And so I've been doing it on their behalf since then, uh, on, on behalf of Billy. and. Um, so here I am today, you know, 44 years later, and uh, four or five documentaries out in the world. Uh, what you see behind me are, you know, images of Billy's books. He's written over 60 books. We have about 10 that have been translated into English. They're the best books anybody could ever want and ever read and learn from. And it's just become that uh, focal point in my life because of the richness of the information that which uh, has just brought an amazing, amazing wealth to so many people who've bothered to get past the best UFO evidence you'll ever see and into the heart of the matter. For those that are new to the Billy Meyer story, can you just give us a quick summary of it? Sure, I'll try. Uh, since it spans 85 years, I'll do my best mm -hmm. and it won't take quite that, that much time to do it. Billy Meyer is a now soon to be 86 year old Swiss man. He has one arm. He lost his uh, most of his left arm in a rather brutal bus accident in Turkey uh, some years ago. And he claims that since he was a five year old boy, that he has been meeting with advanced space traveling, highly intelligent human beings from another star system, human beings, not little gray guys and imaginary reptilians and all this. And that this is a, um, a lifelong mission, if you will, that he agreed to take on very much farther, longer ago than in his current life. We'll leave that for what it is at the moment. And that, uh, it has brought him information and experiences and opportunities and tragedies and great epiphanies that really, I think, are historically singular. I, can, I cannot imagine that anybody's lived a life like Billy Meyer. Now, there's some people in the past who were also contact people for this race going back thousands of years who doubtless had fantastic lives as well, and also in some cases very challenging, brutal even. And Meyer has maintained a great equanimity through it. He is a great living example of the teaching that he brings forward. The core purpose, I'll jump from five years old, if you will, to the core purpose of this material is not about UFOs. It's not about dazzling us with the greatest UFO evidence we will have ever and will ever see. It's really fundamentally about our future survival and the things, the mechanisms by which we can assure that, and also a great amount of information, historical and otherwise, as to how humankind has gotten itself in this extremely dangerous you know, place and time. And uh, lots of controversial information that people, you know, I, I like to say that there's something in this case to offend everybody, as well as to captivate everybody. It's like an equal opportunity offender experience. And part of that offense happens when people are less familiar with the depth of the information. So if you say a given thing, you know, if I throw out a phrase or a concept that's like a buzzword for people, 
it's because they also have not had the opportunity or taken the opportunity to think through that which is presented in this material and that which is so important to us and is very marginalized and trivialized in our world. And this one man, Billy Edward Albert Meyer, took on this opportunity that he always at any point was free to, to put down, to leave, to, to abandon, uh, based on all the things that would come his way and that did 25 attempts in his life. Uh, but he always stayed the course. He might have moments when he sat back to say, I'm not sure if I can continue, but he continued because this is a, it's kind of a universal mission, if you want to put it in those terms. And we can go into any and all of this that you want to explore. The term Pleiadians is very popular now. Was Billy Meyer the first person to mention them? Yes. And the interesting thing about it, of course, is for, for people who are uh, more familiar with this material now, they know that while Meyer was the first person to mention so-called Pleiadians, he's also the person who revealed back in about 19, well, it was either 95 or 98, that there are no Pleiadians, that the Pleiades has no life forms, no, no planets that could bear life. And even when he was first asked in 1975 to use the term, allegedly by these people, he said, well, why? There's no life in the Pleiades, and you people are the Pleiaran people. And they said, yes, well, we know that, and you know that, but you are about to start a worldwide controversy, and what is going to happen in short order after you start publishing your information is that people will come out of the proverbial woodwork claiming that they are contactees, that they are, uh, they have, uh, you know, relationships and bear children with Pleiadians and that they are channeling Pleiadians and everything will suddenly be Pleiadians. And, and, and the, the woman, Semyaze, who said to him, you won't need to keep asking us whether these people are legitimate because we have no contacts with anybody else. And there have been some sporadic even accidental encounters with people, but we solely really have these contacts with you. You're the only person that you know we meet with that comes on board our ships as you have since childhood. And so just don't you don't have to bother to ask, even though he would check some people because there were people who would come forward saying, well, you know, I'm having this experience. And he would come and say, you know, I know you said there's nobody else doing this. But what about these people that are making these claims about this, that, and the other thing and contacts with all sorts of supposed other extraterrestrials? And they would always tell them the same, same thing. Well, mm -mm, you know, it ain't happening. So it's a very controversial case for that reason, too. I think that's a pretty explosive statement, you know, that there are no true Pleiadians out there. That's right. And they are not Pleiadians. They are Pleiarans. Yes, Pleiaran. I And... I'm sorry, good job. I, I, I just thought the word play yarn was kind of uh, another way of pronouncing Pleiadian, you know, from Billy's native language. I didn't realize it was something completely different. It's connected to the term Pleiades as well, because apparently playar or the playars in, in, in their terminology represents the star system in their dimension of the Pleiades. So, and so the word Pleiadian, they made a word that would, you know, use what we call that star system, uh, Pleiades. And, you know, but it, 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 as you say, it's explosive because people don't realize Billy Myers, a person in 1975, starts that term, that whole cosmology comes out. And what has to be said at this time a little bit is that, you know, I, I've been in this for quite a, quite a while. And I've explored, you know, people say, well, you should have really looked at this case or that case. I said, I did. Well, you know, where's the evidence? And, and that's the thing that can and should be said about all of these claims. This, when I was, you know, even beginning to do my presentations in 1987, this topic was marginalized. It was a tabloid topic, a cultic kind of a thing. You know, UFOs, flying saucers, extraterrestrials, aliens. And so suddenly in the past few years, it took all this time. And now it's everybody is into UAPs. They changed the terminology. 
And it's very telling that they changed it to unidentified aerial phenomena because people have been, pardon me, dumbed down so much that phenomena is what is their main concern and it's what is directed at them, not substance. Not, wait a minute, The de- what is this thing? What is the essence of this thing? So people nowadays, there's no shortage of people online to think that they know about this race and that race and this and this craft and that. And it's just like, I go, oh, gosh, you know, if people really had any idea of what they're talking about, they would they would do a 180 right away. They jump into this material. But I can guarantee you that the people that always come forward to attack, the first thing they do is they cite skeptical attacks, which we've debunked. I've taken on every skeptic that would step forward. And if they and most of them wouldn't debate me. So I'd had to, you know, publish articles showing that they're wrong. I gave a skeptic an opportunity in a film that we made in 19, not 19, in well, we filmed in 2006, put it out 2008. It's called The Silent Revolution of Truth, arguably the best UFO documentary ever. I will say that as neutrally as I can, although I'm rather partial. And there was a skeptic who had been involved with an organization attacking this material since 2001. I gave him a segment in the film to make his best case. After the film came out, he actually had to retract his presentation. And recent and and the things that came from that were so outrageous. Uh, by by demolishing the skeptics, this particular guy falsified an email I had sent. He they published information on a, a, a website for an organization called Center for Inquiry, or Center for Inquiry West it was the first organization I came at to prove their claims against the case. They published these false. Inf- uh, e- you know, email things. And then the guy, the skeptic who we gave this, this whole segment to, actually stole the brand name They Fly and put out two false websites uh, under our brand name, pretending to be a representation of our work on the Billy Meyer case. And the company that, uh, you know, he was originally in associated with all these people went nuts the skeptics trying to take down this material but they could not address the evidence and that's where it stands today skeptics who talk about ufos none of them now will mention the meyer case because they can't we've already proven this i'll just throw this out to a legal and scientific standard that these people whoever they are however they are have actual space travel and time travel. And anybody can check this information and come to the same conclusion because of the evidence in the case. It's so in our faces. They don't tell us how they do the time travel. They explain what it is and various things about it, but the evidence for it is ironclad. And that's the higher standard of proof in this case far beyond even the UFOs. Since we're talking about evidence, what do you consider to be the best evidence in Billy's case? Well, uh, it's interesting. The the UFO evidence is what uh, people first generally get attracted to. The photos, the films, the video where Meyer is in the frame videoing himself from behind him while there's a UFO hovering in a tree in broad day. I mean, it's amazing, but even though these photos and and films and all have been independently analyzed and authenticated by real experts, not silly skeptics and people who don't know what they're talking about, you know, the late astronaut Gordon Cooper, there's a one minute and 30 second clip or whatever where he's talking, oh, there's a Swiss man uh, who's meeting with extraterrestrials. That's it, Billy Meyer. I've seen the photos. They're authentic. They're good. I don't know why people are attacking it as a whole. This is an astronaut. Then you mentioned in the beginning that I was interrogated. Yeah, I, I got a call on a Saturday morning from a guy I didn't know, an older, rough sounding guy back in January of 2017. My name's Joe. I'm an investigator. Will you talk about the Billy Meyer case? I said, well, sure, that's what I do. Are you sure you'll talk about it? I said, yeah, why? He says, I think it's a roaring hoax. 
And he didn't tell me anything more about himself at that point. For three months, every Saturday morning at right around 8.30, phone rang, it's Joe. And it, it quickly, from it was like maybe the second or third conversation on, was no longer a conversation. It was an interrogation. Okay, now let's talk about this. How do you answer this? And I, at first I'm going, whoa. And I thought, and I've said this before to people, I said, you know, this guy was great because he knew what he was talking about. Not UFOs. Well, he's, he didn't know anything about UFOs, and he would reveal that to me. But he was clearly a real investigator. He was somebody that knew how to ask questions, how to box somebody in to look for contradictions, etc. So at the end of March of 2017, we're I don't know, I don't hear from him again until August of that year. The phone rings August, months later. Hi, it's me, Joe. I said, yeah, hi, how are you doing? I know it's you. Still want to talk to me? I said, sure. He says, okay, I'll tell you who I am. And then I'll tell you about your Billy Meyer UFO case. You talk about accents. You know, this guy was clearly East Coast, real East Coast kind of guy. And I said, well, okay, who are you? And he says, okay, go to your computer, open your email. Um, open the email. And I'm looking, there's photographs of tabletops, there's several photos, and they are filled with standing citations. And clear enough to read his name, the you know, USAF, OSI, whatever, Department of Defense. He's this guy was top level. All of these were glowing recommendations about this guy. Promote him whenever you can. This is the, you know, he's the best we've got, blah, 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 blah. And he said to me, look. You saw that stuff, right? I said, yeah. He says, okay, delete it. I said, okay. He says, look, I was top over there, you know, with the guys at the top, I'm up there with those guys. We vet people who are either already in or aspiring to higher office, people who could have their fingers on the nuclear trigger. We ferret out moles. I read body language. I do this very well. So, uh, you know, um, I checked out everything you said. The woman that you said was a young girl at an ashram in India when Billy Meyer was there. She checked out. She's now, as you said, she's a retired diplomat for the UN. She had nothing to gain by coming for. He's, he's feeding me the story now. And he said, so here's the bottom line. Your Billy Meyer UFO case is 100% ironclad, authentic, and I will take on any skeptics on your behalf. He did. He took on a guy named Kevin Randall and a guy in India who uh, was alternately either pro-case or a skeptic on the case. And he calls me back. I, I don't know if he, he talked to the guys one week apart, whatever it was. He said, look, I'm not going to talk to these people anymore. They don't know anything. They don't understand research. They don't know investigation. So what I'm doing is I've written up this paper here for you. It'll march you through how anybody can determine, walk through the protocols. You don't have to be an investigator. Just be able to think, go through, follow the steps, and then you're going to understand why and how, you know, how I've come to the conclusion, why you can come to the conclusion that this is authentic. Billy Meyer, a man with hundreds of UFO photographs, don't people wonder how he ever you know, was able to always be at the right place for the photos and those films? You're talking all pre-digital stuff? How, he had to be informed by somebody to be right where he was all the time. None of these people can think. They are all in their imaginations. And so he says, I'm done with these people. It's a pain in the ass. So I said, okay, Joe. So he periodically called over, the, maybe it was the next year or so, we, you know, we carry on some conversations a year and a half. But he, he'd had it with people in ufology because he he was tasked with protecting the safety and security of the American people. He did not ask silly questions and he did not chase lights in the sky. Like people today are, oh, UAPs. And say, you know, forget it. And this will sound probably crazy. I mean, you open the door to this question. I tell people, forget about UFOs. I mean, if you want the best evidence for UFOs, then you look at the Meyer material. You, you can duplicate tests yourself just on your computer. You can know that this is real. But then you've got to go to where the people in ufology never go. They never ask 
this one question. If these contacts are real, what's the reason for them? It's not for us to chase lights in the sky. It's not for us to just ooh and ah over somebody else's aircraft, like a cargo cult, you know, so often somewhere in Borneo or whatever, you know, oh, you know, build a, you know, build a temple to the craft. Like people think this way because they put everything outside of themselves, religion, politics, all this stuff. It's all outside of you and you're supposed to take the direction for your life from out there, not from within here, which is the core of the Meyer material, by the way. So when you get past that and you ask that question and they say, effectively, if you start to look through this, you realize that the reason for all of this, 85 years of you know, in a man's life, 80 years in a man's life, it's to help us assure our very threatened future survival. And so the best evidence in this case isn't the UFO stuff. It's the prophetic, prophetically accurate, be precise, error-free, scientific, geopolitical, environmental, medical, and economic information that Meyer has published for, well, over 70 years since he was a 10 year old boy. Now, a lot of the stuff from back then was held back, didn't come out for certain reasons, but he's been publishing stuff certainly from at least 1975 and before, because he did publish and send letters around the world when he was 14 years old with the help of his school teachers. There were people who recognized, who knew what he was doing and that he was in touch with people who were very advanced and they helped him and they remained pretty much in the, in the background school teachers a world famous psychologist named carl jung things about this man and, uh, this whole person that people don't know and it's from the beginning been intended to get people to start paying attention because they've known for a very long time where humankind was headed, and that they also knew that they couldn't again, I use the word again, because their ancestors did intercede in our world a long time ago, and that we would have to simply get put into our world the evidence, the information, and we would have to take responsibilities ourselves for, for getting through it. So if you publish information, not only about events and things and discoveries on Earth, but in our solar system, outside of our planet. If you publish this information long before it is, not only has it occurred, but that it could possibly be known by anybody on Earth through no means whatsoever, especially with the astronomical stuff and future events, then you finally come when you just reason, when you are satisfied, when you see the copyrights and all that stuff, and you know this man did publish this then. We have, I'd like to say we've got at least 250 examples of it. Error-free, never theories, always accurate information. And sometimes when it's later corroborated, the same words are used by the scientists who've just discovered it. There's so much of it. And if people would go and start to read this and do the thinking, they would come to the, how could he do this? I brought information to a scientist in Flagstaff at the USGS, United States Geological Survey. Nice guy, NASA USGS scientist, Ken Herkenhoff, working on the imaging from the Mars rover. I took an impromptu meeting with him. I went up there to see him and he didn't know me from Adam and he was very gracious. He came out, how can I help you? And I said, well, you know, there's some things um, I'd like to share with you about uh, Mars information. Okay, here you go, three pages worth of stuff. When you have time, get back to me. Well, it kind of blew his mind. He did not know how to deal with it. His answer was a question. Could the man be a lucky guesser? Could he be making lucky guesses? And I said, no. 
There was information there that Ken, as a Mars scientist, didn't know. That, and this man had published 20, 30 years ago, and NASA had finally discovered it. Ken didn't know it, though. This is so deep and so presented so simply and matter-of-factly that it escapes most people. It intimidates the heck out of scientists, especially those who are now jumping on the UFO bandwagon. Oh, UFO this and that. You've got Avi Loeb and Robin Hansen, who <laughs> unfortunately uh, had a collision with the truth and didn't know how to deal with it. A uh, nice guy named Jonathan Jang, who has silly notions about sending things into space, letting people, anybody else out there, if they do exist, and there's plenty of them, know where we are and who. We, I mean, people, because this is the time of all about me and celebrity and make as much money as possible, people who should instead be prioritizing their scientific integrity, their intellectual honesty, and coming face to face with the fact that there are thousands of people around the world now who know more about extraterrestrial life, UFOs, evidence, time travel, than any of them. But they can't deal with that. Their egos don't allow it. So Avi Loeb puts out nonsense books and makes silly claims about a hunk of space rock, really kind of a comet asteroid thing that came through the solar system. And he wants to turn it into a spaceship because that's where the bucks are. Let's sell everything on the basis of its extraterrestrials. I've reached out to these people. I've sent them information, evidence. I've offered them any and everything they want. They don't want to. Suddenly they'd be, they're reduced to being less knowledgeable than little old guys like me and many other people, young, old, male, female, in the sciences, outside of the sciences, who know the truth about things and who are watching the unfoldment of prophecies and predictions that now are, to a large degree, ceaseless and unstoppable. And no matter how hard we try, there is a great deal of censorship and suppression, uh, dilution, diversion, distraction. And if people knew more about this, they might want to take some action, at least in their own lives. So I'm sorry, I kind of went on a long, long one there, but this is, you pull the thread on the Billy Meyer case and that sweater unravels. Can we talk about a couple of his most credible photos? Sure. Um, well, I mean, my gosh, there's so many. Well, the, the ones that get, that people find to be the most difficult to deal with turn out to be quite credible. And that's what's called the WC UFO or the wedding cake UFO. There's 63 of those photos. Uh, the majority taken in the daytime. There's one video, which we mentioned here, where Billy Meyer is in the frame there, and he's pointing at the craft, and he holds up his camera. And um, this craft was jumped on, if you will, <laughs> figuratively speaking, uh, by people who said, well, it's nothing but a, a garbage bin lid that's been painted silver with Christmas balls around it and what have you. The examination of the photos, there's a 74-page analysis of the photos, shows quite different results, but it's, it's also understandable why people think it's that simple because, and, and in Switzerland, they showed there's a garbage can that a, a company made, I think it's called Harco or something, it makes these garbage cans, which came out after Billy Meyer's photos, by the way. And they are the lid is so similar, but not exactly the same. And this is the devils in the details to the main bottom part of this craft. But when you look in on the, the details where we kind of zoomed in on the detail of this craft that's sitting on the ground, and you look at the machining and these crystals and all this stuff, you realize that ain't no garbage can lid with Christmas tree balls. We have to understand something fundamentally, and that goes actually for all the evidence, because these people are not stupid. They are sometimes a little naive about humankind. They were in the beginning, but they also put things in the context where there is an out for skeptics. That, well, 
a, a skeptic isn't forced to accept the reality of this because people who identify as skeptics rather than say i'm a scientist and i'm i'm skeptical about things but that's different people who say i'm a skeptic you have to prove it to me that means they already have complete preconceived cosmologies about everything and unless the evidence and you fit their cosmology it can't be true so skeptics are effectively quite religious in their own way even though most of them are atheists so they knew this that people if you force people to accept this if you force them to recognize right away that this is real and it's going on lots of people would be destroyed emotionally psychologically uh, this could just provoke very very bad outcomes as an example i'll give you examples of how i could say it's true there are a couple skeptics one's named michael Shermer, a big prominent skeptic uh, he got involved in an online uh, discussion with my research assistant who basically destroyed him because he could not address an answer real quite he kept throwing out you know glib phrases to try to diminish the, the evidence he couldn't and it's, it's, that's all online there's a guy named Mick West who's a you know big prominent skeptic so he tried to debunk Myers thing and it didn't work so now he's very prominent online talking about the whole UFO thing and the government and why the it's it's just showing that most of this is just phenomenon you know it's nothing real every time but I will send things out and I will call him out on it and share with people what I said. he can't even now acknowledge the existence of this this is like a fundamentalist mentality very tightly wound up that if anything comes in that's going to cause question here it's it, you know so I I don't beat on his head, but I point out his hypocrisy. This WC UFO that you see, and any of these photos that you look at, we do not have a context. You see a lot of people say, oh, it looks just like a flying saucer from the 50s. Well, where do you think people got that idea of a flying saucer from the 50s? These craft have been seen for a very long time. They go back even in history. So take any of the photos and look at them and draw your own conclusions. You can look at the independent analyses, both of, uh, you know, we have this independent analysis that was done back in the late 70s. And then you have this other one of the so-called pendulum UFO, where we have this film clip of the UFO going around a tree. And of course, skeptics say, well, that's just a model on a, on a pen. You know, it's like a pendulum, which is impossible and the analysis on that shows the impossibility and the clip itself when people realize that you could not conceivably actually control a model based on you know the, the geometry if you will like if this thing is down here at, at the base and it's the, the distance to the point where the attachment where the manipulation would take place the behavior of, of this object is going to be totally different. A skeptic who tried to uh, duplicate this in 2009, I, I was in correspondence with him pointing out to him why he wasn't getting it right and that the craft on that particular video stops for a moment at an angle and he didn't have his craft. So he had to attach another wire and with two hands manipulate the thing that Billy just simply filmed with one. It goes on and on and on with the, with the UFO evidence. And I discovered these photographs of a UFO interacting with a top secret stealth fighter in 1981, discovered those back in 2020 in a storage unit in Moab, Utah. These images destroy the entire government military narrative of a UFO threat. Total non-hostile interaction between a UFO connected to this case, these photos taken by the lead investigator himself, in this case, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. And you see this craft and you see the stealth in different positions as it came in to examine and then flew away. A lot of work has already been done analyzing these. Uh, uh, an expert formerly with Kodak has authenticated them, actually printed, taken in uh, no later than and printed in early 1980s, 81 was when this flight took place. And I was asked after leaving a message for a, a committee 
headed by Representative Andre Carson, I was asked to send in, send these images to us for our committee. I did. Nice woman who was the intermediary. And she said, well, I'm going to make sure these, you know, work their way up the chain. If they did, and they probably did, they were censored. You won't see them anywhere except if you, if you go here or if somebody else is copying them somewhere. It's the best photographic evidence anybody will ever see. A UFO and a U U.S. stealth plane? Not a light in the sky, not a Tic Tac video where you get, try, it's like a video game from the 80s or something? No. And pardon me, the people in ufology, the experts and the, all this, too stupid to comprehend what they are looking at. Stupid only means unthinking. Unless people are willfully stupid and don't want to think. And why would I say these harsh things? Well, read the prophecies and predictions and take a look at what's happening now. And then, you know, pause for a few moments. Reconsider what would happen if actual extraterrestrials contacted us through one man on Earth who could stay the course. When everybody else, as soon as they were faced with evidence, they either wanted to become famous and rich or it scared them so badly that they wouldn't talk about it. One man. And the first bullet and second bullet go flying by his head. I like to say there's an imaginary banner and it says, we suggest a career change. And Billy Meyer never took that hint. He just kept on going and he still does. And the attempts on his life and his character, everything else continue to this day. If people want to see more of the photos and videos, they can find them on your website, right? Well, the best evidence is on the blog, theyflyblog.com. And my first original website, theyfly.com, has it's got 200 articles and all sorts of stuff there. I mean, uh, probably between the blog and the website, there's about 2,000 articles filled with Myers information, with corroborations and evidence and predictions and prophecies and UFO photos and testimonials and you name it. You name it. So it's there. And all that information, of course, is free. If you want Meyer's great books, yeah, you can buy a book. If you want any of my films, you can buy a film. But we do it to put out as much as we can absolutely free so people can think their way through this and recognize that that which is coming, which has been warned about for decades, if not centuries, if not millennia, is upon us. And we need to prepare for that. We need to learn how to come together as, you know, people that work cooperatively with each other, as close or distant as relationships may be, to have those things on hand. And it's not like, you know, we're not the, you know, the stereotype of crazy survivalists. No, we're people uh, take the hint from the folks in Switzerland. They stock their cupboards well enough. They make sure they, they have the things that they need for given extended periods of time. There's a lot of common sense things, and there's no shortage of that information now, fortunately online from a lot of people, for better or for worse. But also the idea of cooperation with people. And that means that when people are of a like mind, and it doesn't all only mean in, in terms of people who, who, you know, we study this material, oh, you have to be into the Meyer material. No, you just have to have you know, be a human being that cares about life and wants to do the right things and cares about people. And, you know, as I say, has your heart and head in the right place and is willing to help others informationally, substantially in different ways, materially, uh, with health, with whatever. Get back to this community feeling. And, you know, a lot of people talk about being patriots. And I don't think all of them know what they're talking about because a patriotism would be an embracement of the citizens of the country in which you live. And of course, all the best of the foundational values, it wouldn't be contributing to polarization. Billy Myers, dating back to 1981 and 87 in writing, predicted two coming U.S. civil wars. I laughed out loud, 1986, I read the 81 stuff. I'm not laughing. A lot of people might not be laughing now. It's all there. It's all been explained. So much has been foretold. Not everything was destined to happen. Many things 
could have been avoided had we listened in time and done what the purpose of a prophecy. I mean, I'm so I just have to say a little more about this. A prophecy is a warning about events that will occur if people do not make course corrections in time. They don't recognize what cause and effect is. This is leading to that, is leading to this. If we make those course corrections, we say we better change that, then we avoid. Predictions are things that will fulfill with 100% certainty. Most of them are of a more cosmic nature, things like the Apophis asteroid that people have heard about that NASA discovered in 2004 that Billy Meyer described in writing in 1981. We've illustrated that information for free, comic book online, six languages, to warn people. NASA denied there was any danger. And then they keep on changing their information. Now they changed the size estimate on Apophis to within 10 meters of what Billy Meyer published and never changed any crucial information. So I, I dive, why, you know, it's like, that's a prediction that's coming this way. And there's two dates when that could impact the earth of our scientists. Don't get together and nudge it off its course, its orbit, whatever. So this isn't so much about the wonderful UFO stuff. It's about us. And I'd like to say to people, don't focus on ETs. If you're fascinated by that, then, you know, have an intention to be like the ETs, the human being, fully human like us, just more advanced, who've learned the things about survival, about peace and harmony and love and freedom and cooperation. And they live that way. And they can reach out from where they are based, where they live on their worlds. And they can come through space and through time to serve other evolving races. So <laughs> I, I, I know I just kind of bring in a lot of stuff here, but this is what we've opened the door to here. You met Billy Meyer in person. Was there anything about him that made him seem different from the average human? Mm -hmm. I, I've met with Billy 20 times in as many years, uh, fortunately. And the first meeting with him, what struck me the most, because I remember it very clearly, not the first time. Well, the first meeting was literally a very quick introduction where a friend of mine, Mark Campbell from Texas and I, in 2000, we took our first trip to the center there and we're walking up after stowing our stuff at the bed and breakfast, walk up to the, the center, the home that he lives in that's also a, a center for the people to do the studies and all that. And Billy comes bursting out of the door just at that moment. And he he has under the, the stump, if you will, of his left arm, he's got some books or something, some papers. And Mark is a very gregarious guy from Texas. He says, Billy, I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody in the world. You know, he's got goes and, and Meyer reaches out his hand and he says, Mark, don't mention it. It's my duty. And he marches off. Now that really resonated to me because of things that had happened in my life when I was homeless and all this stuff and focusing on learning how to do one's duty in life that one has to determine for themselves primarily. So it was a couple of days later that I actually had a little FaceTime with him when he, we were all out working together. Everybody gets out there and works and does stuff with people from different countries and everybody's trying to figure out how to communicate in different languages and what have you. And Billy had weighed me over. He said, I want to ask you about this person in America I've heard about. Or you, you might know him. It wasn't a big celebrity. It was just somebody he'd heard about. And I'm standing there and talking to Billy. And while I'm talking to him, I'm having this awareness. And I thought, this is really unusual. It's just like this is somebody that knows me and I know them. It's like forever. This guy, is he's an open book. He's not trying to impress me with who he is, which is pretty nifty stuff. And he's not defending it. You know, he doesn't have me blocked. He's just asked me a question as a person. And he's so open, receptive. And I'm I'm so aware of that talking to him. And I realized, you know, there's, there's a fundamental teaching in this material about learning what neutrality is and learning what neutral positive thinking is and how that is the proper way to think about virtually everything, instead of thinking in partisan and, uh, you know, 
very loaded preconceived notions about things that you encounter, even if you think you know what everything is, to have the capacity to see things as they are, that's a neutral part. And with the positive part is to be able to then formulate and control your thinking, the way you feel and act about things from a perception of where you see what a thing is, and then you make your determination, neutral and then positive. So you're moving towards the positive, but you first have to see a thing for what it is. And it can be a negative thing that you can quickly recognize. It's not like everything is, oh, everything's wonderful because I'm neutral. No, but Meyer exemplifies in his being this. I've seen this with, you know, 20 years, I've had conversations with him. I've watched him interact with people, his family. And he maintains this kind of an equanimity. And it's not a cold and distant thing when you say people are neutral, like I'm completely neutral. I'm, I'm you know, I'm Spock. No, there's the, the human warmth is a very warm person, but and but he's not gushing over at you. He's not trying to bring you in or convince you of anything or manipulate. So he has that presence of neutrality, which is open to that which is happening in the moment. And if that might be a long answer, that's one of the things that... Uh, Every time I've met with Billy, it's just like, there he is, right there. And that relaxes a person. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to defend against anything. You're right there. And you're not being judged and, and uh, you know, having prejudicial perceptions as the context for your inter interaction. We spoke about the play yarns earlier. Have you ever met one? No, never will. I've had information... Look, nobody meets with the play Aaron except Meyer, and not even his family. Now, family members have accidentally seen them sometimes, and other people, when they happen to have been on the property and they weren't shielded, or something was just a little, there was a window of opportunity that shouldn't have existed, and then they kind of disappear from that, but they've been seen. And as people have seen some other members of some other races very briefly, but it's maybe two handfuls. However, I was given specific information on a couple of occasions from them for me that was written out by Meyer and passed to me. They told him what to tell me about some things. And it was not, it wasn't a big special thing. It was that the most important of these things had to do with a project that I was invited to participate in that I did not realize was going to be a massive trap set up by a skeptic, a guy named Kel Korf, who'd been a longtime opponent of this case. I'd had debated him on re in a radio interview and kind of kicked him around a bit. And then he approached me sometime later saying, you know, hey, let's just do a project together, a C C DVD project, actually, is what it was. And, you know, you will have your position, I'll have mine, it'll be really nice, and you can promote and sell these, and I can promote and sell these. Oh, okay, fine, whatever. And at some point, I wrote to Switzerland, I wrote to Billy, and, you know, said, well, what do you think of this? And I got a thing back, you do what you do, you're a free person, no obligations. And then I got a different email about a day and a half later saying, from from uh, Billy's, uh, you know, main assistant who speaks a lot of, you know, fluent English and everything. And he said, um, Billy suggested you wait a minute. Uh, he had a meeting with so-and-so and he asked them to look in and they did. And things are not quite as you perceive them. So uh, we will have a transcript of that for you tomorrow. And indeed, the next day there was a transcript, brief conversation between Meyer and one of the alleged extraterrestrials explaining that this was a setup, a trap, if in effect, to get me to promote attacks against the, the whole material, against myself and Billy, and that, that they recommend, they didn't say don't do it. They said, we recommend that you don't do it because this is not going to be good. So I found a way to withdraw from that, just saying to the guy, no, you do what you want to do. And he kept pushing, and I said, well, I have advice that this isn't going to be beneficial for me to. And then as soon as I told him that the play Aaron were involved with that, he launched on a website he had, which had been just so, oh, Michael Horn and I are going to do this wonderful project together. Now there were literally 300 attacks against Meyer, against me, death threats. And 
the thing was so virulent, so bad that when I wrote to the web hosting company, actually to two different ones, they both took down the site. Now, that may not happen these days anymore because people are so crazy with each other, but it was pretty bad. When he popped up again on another site, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to ask that site to go down because I'll just keep an eye on what comes out and see where this goes. Um, Hal Korf uh, was one of the skeptics who has been vicious and virulent against Meyer, who misrepresented himself, went to the center years ago in disguises, and he let slip something a year or so ago. Uh, <laughs> he's basically a self-admitted file who was filming children at the center through a hidden camera. I mean, this stuff with skeptics gets very, very dark. And he would never come forward to meet Billy and talk about it. So he put up this, there was a video in which he admits to all this other stuff, thinking that he's showing what, what terrible people Billy and his friends are by having children at the center. And instead he's, uh, it goes on. I don't want to go too much more into that whole thing, but basically, you know, this is, this is very colorful material. Let's just put it that way. You've been covering this case for decades. How has your life changed personally for you doing this? Well, I should explain this. I have a pretty rich background myself. My early life was focused on the arts primarily. I was an art student. And while I was even in art school, I had like a teacher buy a painting and stuff. I was doing, you know, kind of for the time, some kind of avant-garde. I don't mean wild abstract, but I was doing unique art. Uh, I was always, I was a songwriter since uh, 17. I did lots and lots of performing. I'm, I've always been creating a lot of stuff. I'm one of the first people to actually create eBooks by that name. We had a website up, I partnered with a guy who was able to do all this stuff, but, and, and lots of different things. I started a fashion fad and all this. And I love my creativity. I just put out a, a you know, downloadable book of 115 of my lyrics. But when I found this material and I started to, you know, to look and went deeper and deeper and deeper. My life did change radically, deeply. Now, I don't mean that everything was, a, you know, fireworks going off. It's just that the answers to questions I've had since childhood and questions that have come up, of course, since then, have been addressed in this material and given me food for thought, to say the least. And I would say have answered those questions to my satisfaction, where I found no satisfactory answers in any other material that I was aware of. It brought me into awareness of, oh, things about myself, my past, relationships and all. I created, one of the things I created, I've created two therapeutic processes as well. In the 90s, I was taken to Europe by a consultant to the late Princess Diana to teach one of my processes to uh, business and corp, you know, corporate business and governmental people in uh, in Holland and Germany, and uh, I created a whole therapeutic process. And so, one of the things that happened around that that I was thinking of when you know when you ask this question, I'm doing that process starting in 1990, and around 2005 or so, I have a DVD teaching this process to people. And so I thought, you know, I should ask Billy about this because I could put this on another website if it's not really something that should be on, on you know, the work I do on the Meyer case. And he wrote back the most surprising thing. He said, no, teach that at every opportunity you get. That's consistent with the teaching in this case. That's part of the teaching. Now, I'm going, well, I don't understand how. So I would later figure out that there's something called vipassana, a form of meditation called vipassana. And this turns out to be something that spontaneously occurred for me, which is a, a, a certainly an, a variation of a different, whole different approach that people can do using a video guide, if you will, 
And then I created another therapy called Future Self, which came out of an experience I had in 1972 where a voice pops in my head and describes all these things, which all occur technologically. So I, I did video. I had a career that I created for myself doing video Future Self sessions with people back in the 80s. And then within a few years ago, I thought, how could I make that available to people? I don't want to do more. So, and I figured out a way to do it. And I put out a little book. It's up on Amazon. It's my site, how people can use their phones and tablets to do this process. So it enriched me in ways in which my intuition, I think, had been heightened. And it brought all sorts of other things my way including people that I otherwise wouldn't have met and in you know opportunities to to travel and present the information so uh it's been an enormous enrichment on a personal level I sit and I try to you know it's like Billy has this book I talked about the I think I talked about I don't know anymore but it's, it's called from the depths of outer space and you learn what it's like for a young boy of five to start meeting with a man who will start making available to him a craft as a child to travel and to do time travel in and how these people live on their world and our true human history. And all this, how would I ever, ever have come up upon that? That's, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, it's, it's enriched my life because they should stop there. Do you feel that this case has been suppressed? And if so, why? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Of course it has. Um, okay. I'll say yes, it has been. It continues to be. Even the people say, well, you can, you can find it here and there. If this is real, do you understand that this is the single most important event, ladies and gentlemen, in all of human history? that you have access to information that could only have been made available through time travel, not this nonsense that you hear online. Well, why would this be suppressed? Well, as you go into this material, you're going to find that the true history of our belief systems, of our religions, who the gods were, where they came from, how it led to us developing not only in, you know, as we say it freely in this material, mind enslaving belief systems that have caused death and destruction and wars all over the world under the guise of being filled with love and kindness, and how th that gave rise to politics as well, political systems and hierarchies. And if this is true, and if the world knew about it, what would happen to the control? religious, political, military, what would happen to all the structures? This is the fears, of course, that the, the powers that be have. And you can understand why that's those realistic fears. Of course, these things should have long ago dissolved, but that's another story. So it means that people would be free. They wouldn't be fearful about what happens after they die, that they're going to be dipped in hot lead because some vengeful creator took it out on you because you didn't believe or that if they think the wrong way about this or think the wrong way about that they won't be able to to you know earn a living or or go to school all the things that are coming down now long foretold by the way coming down now billy foretold biochipping 1958 and people now are already willing to let themselves be turned into nothing more than controlled farm animals so if the liberation took place without you know everybody having to go in the streets and blow things up it doesn't guarantee a better you know system follows it there's no wisdom we would learn what it means to be what the play i'm referred to as true human beings with love peace freedom harmony joy wisdom compassion we would freely give of ourselves and get whatever we needed. We wouldn't be punished. Things aren't withheld. We aren't beaten over the head with things because we think the wrong way or what have you. The way these people live, it's explained in this wonderful book in great depth and people can contemplate. Would you like to live like that or do you want this? 
we're we're taught that the highest values in life are to amass more than you can reasonably use in your lifetime simply for the sake of amassing it. Oh, Donald Trump or Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. Wow, how much food can you actually shove down your <laughs> when you sit down at the table? We we have no concept of what real life is about. And we are destroying this planet so badly. Greta Thunberg has no idea. None of the people out there, I would say 99% of people have no idea now of what's coming environmentally. What we're having that's been foretold for so long because this material has been suppressed. It's known about, oh, they know about it at the higher levels of the intelligence agency. Yeah, they know about it in Russia. They know about it in the Vatican. They know about it, you know, in Langley and all, certain people. They hate it because it means that the agenda for power and control is threatened by the knowledge of the availability and the value of true peace, freedom, love, and harmony. Go figure, <laughs> you know, instead, climb over each other for pieces of paper or digital coins or whatever you want. But that's the thing about what the, the material brings to people is the realization of the having of all that one could possibly want has been a given, but it has to be uncovered and developed within ourselves. And it doesn't happen through any of our traditional, if you will, established systems, controls. You have to learn. Yeah, it's suppressed, but you'll find it if if you want. If somebody wants to get the book from the depths of outer space or any other Billy Meyer books, where's the best place to get them? Come to my blog. We link to my bookstore, which is on the website. So either way, you can come to They Fly blog. You'll see online store. And by the way, understand, as I said, there's 2,000 articles between the site and the blog. You can read to your heart's content for free. And I'm not saying that so that you don't get the book because they're, they go far deeper into the how. The how. And that then becomes you know, personal self-responsibility. But come look at the shop, see the things that are there. I answer all my emails, for better or for worse. It takes a little time. So if you have a question about something, about a book, about a film, about this or that, you write and you get an answer. And then you choose that which you feel is best for you, you resonate with, you try this thing or that. And, you know, one of the things I'm a bit lax in, I haven't put up all the testimonials I get from people who read the books. I just I put up the ad for the book and tell you what it's about. But, pe you know, people's lives change from this material in very profound ways. So I'm glad to make the books available, of course. And uh, we have a, a monthly study group that's done online for free. That's another thing. You want to talk to other people? It's a leaderless group. In other words, there's no authority. It's like I, I answer questions or I want to do a gig to make this material more known and available in the world. I don't know everything by a long I don't I, I know very little. In, in terms of what this is, we all know very little. So we can approach it without having to pretend to be experts. You know, oh yeah, I'm the world's leading expert on UFOs for certain reasons, because nobody else is dealing with this and other things but that doesn't mean anything in terms of when you start to touch into this and you have good guidance a good teacher who's written the cleanest best information in history that he also says isn't it's not that he's the author of it all it is sourced from this universe this creation this is the ancient teaching for all life forms in the universe, all human life forms. It, it goes, that's like when you said, you know, we just touched the surface. Yeah, explain that. Well, we'll we can get to that. But the books are there and the, the online discussion thing, write me, I'll send you, you, send you a link to people, send you a link and it's open, it's free. Everybody discusses. Nobody's the great authority on their own. It's very uh, democratic in that sense, non-politically speaking. Michael, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Billy Meyer has often said the human being is the smith of their own destiny. We forge our own destiny. We do that by learning how to think, how thinking works, how thoughts lead to feelings, 
lead to thoughts, lead to actions, and that the immutable law, universal law of cause and effect, is an equal opportunity provider offender, depending on how we work with it. And when we learn all this, then we are able to, even as we begin to learn those principles, we are more able to responsibly create the destiny, the lives we prefer. Michael, thank you for that message, and thank you for being my guest. Welcome. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.